We will start in on the afternoon activities. This includes the IETF report with Kathy Aronson. We send Kathy off to the IETF so she can track all this, come back and report it to you. And I have to say it's a thankless job, though we're going to thank her afterwards. And, um, and uh, just very happy to have her here uh, and her insight into all the goings on at IETF because it's quite a lot of information. Kathy, over to you. Take as long as you like. You don't want me to take as long as I'd like. But, um, so I try every month of the year to do night photography. And um, this was in March in London, but it was at night. So I think it counts. But in December and January and February in Jackson, it's a little bit colder, just saying. Okay. So a couple of things about my report. This covers two IETFs. So it covers the November IETF and the March IETF. So, that, so if you're looking up something, because there's a lot of exercise for the reader in here, just know that it might be from the Singapore IETF 100, or it might be from IETF 101. Um, this is sort of a helicopter view of the IETF, so the slides are very dense. There's some slides I probably won't talk about, but you might be interested to look that group up if it, if it impacts your daily life or whatever. So, um, yeah, and I'm not a DNSSEC expert by any stretch of the imagination, and there is a ton of DNSSEC and RPKI in here. Yeah, that's that. Okay, so I learned a valuable lesson. I don't know how many here know um, Alison Menken, but she's somebody I've looked up to my entire networking career. And if you spend a lot of time around her, you get volunteered for things. You get nominated for things. It's pretty cool, but I was on the... Advanced Network Research Prize Selection Committee, which was great. I read all these really interesting papers. They're all published before they're submitted. Um, so it's a little bit different kind of selection process than like if you were selecting it for publication. But these two didn't win, but they're both published papers and they both affect this community. The first one is talking about geolocation and using the databases available to uh, see where addresses are, and it references Aaron, and the quote from the document is, the worst city level accuracy for all the databases is observed for Aaron addresses. So this, this touches upon our whole validation of the database, all that sort of stuff, and they saw that in their research. So it's a pretty interesting paper. Um, the other one um, is about they're analyzing the IP address markets and they're trying to predict and look at the data and see if they can, they can determine whether that address was transferred or not and they have some concept of transfers in the wild and those would be the ones that maybe the address was transferred but it doesn't show up in an RIR database and I sort of debate whether if it doesn't get logged in the database, did it really happen? Anyway, it's a pretty interesting paper, and it, since it impacts this community, I felt that I should at least point it out, and I sent both of these to the AC uh, at one point or another. So, so the other thing that's, that's um, happening at the IETF is the V6 working groups, which of course I need to go to for this presentation, they've decided that it's super fun to turn off V4 during the V6 working groups, which is super frustrating if you're trying to get anything that you need to get done, done. But, they, but we did find some bugs, and I was gonna give a big shout out to Lee Howard, because I think it was his idea, but he's not here. So I'll talk some more about the problems that we found when they did that in a bit. So IEPG is the operations group that meets on the Sunday before the IETF, and the IETF continues to seem to have little limited knowledge that it exists, but it's been meeting for about 20 years. And um, this is the website where this, the slides and stuff are, um, and there's a mailing list. Let's see. So this is a survey. They're doing a server, survey of control plane security mechanisms and talking about different ways to secure the network. Um, let's see. So the, this is a, a study that they're doing of domain name server latency and how to make the latency less. 
and whether a bigger any cast is better or a smaller any cast or maybe it needs to be bigger but it needs to be the right size and the right distribution and there's some more things I'll talk about there's a lot of DNS stuff that happens at the IETF these days so um, there was actually an IPv6 DOS attack. IPv6, bleh, IPv6 has arrived, apparently. Um, and there's a bunch of documentation about the open resolvers um, that, caught, that were used to amplify the attack. And I, I, I've heard that you know, there, there have been attacks before, but this was the first really observed, documented attack using IPv6. So the, the main takeaway from that is that we need to make V6 at least is hardened in the DNS as V4, otherwise this will probably continue. And there's some links to news articles about it. Let's see. Um, so Jeff Houston always gives these really great um, presentations, and this one's really all about IP fragmentation. And as we do V6 and we do DNSSEC and we do all these things that make the packets bigger, we still have a 1500 byte MTU on Ethernet. So we're limited in the network by the size of the packet that before it gets fragmented. And a lot of failures are happening because the packets are getting fragmented and firewalls and all sorts of things filter the fragments. So there, there, there's a lot of folks looking at how, to, how do you tell the DNS, in this case, how do you tell the DNS to just start using TCP and not wait for these failures? So, and like I said, I'm always amazed that the internet even works because the stuff is so broken, yet we all use it and it seems to work when we use it. So, let's see, what's next? So, the RIPE Atlas folks, they have those probes, sorry, I didn't mean to be really loud. They have those probes that are in everybody's places and like I have one in my house in Wyoming. I think I might be the only one of two in Wyoming. And now they're starting to look at client to client traffic as opposed to client to server traffic and does like traffic within a country go between go to an internet exchange point into another country and back and that sort of thing so performance from client to client because there's so many of these probes now that they can actually look at that um, let's see so um, yeah and then this is a there's a whole lot of stuff that they're talking about because we didn't roll over the key signing key in the DNS sec in October, and they're planning it for October again. So there's been there's a lot of talks at this IETF and a lot of work being done trying to determine are we ready, what's going to break if we're not, um, and all that sort of stuff. So this is one of those one of those presentations. So like I said, we didn't roll the key as planned, um, and there, there's a lot of people. I think I have another slide of Jeff's presentation about trying to determine if we're ready to roll the key. And I don't know if anybody in this meeting is going to talk about that that knows more than I do, but there's a lot of work being done. So um, ROAs, so the, in the, when you're validating BGP routes, you use a ROA. And um, there's a lot, they're, they're, they're looking at w which countries have the most foreign ROAs. So like, in Colombia, it's their Colombian routes, but they're being routed via other ISPs. So the autonomous system number and the ROA is from another country, and so there's a lot of strain. Some of the some of this is malicious intent, and some of it is just how the network is connected together, and so that's what this talk was about. Uh, let's see. Oh, and so this this was a talk about raw time versus real time. So when you use NTP, or you you need to know that it's 12:42 a.m., but maybe you only really need to know that it's two seconds after the other thing happened, which would be raw time. So the, this woman was looking at a whole thing of which protocols really need NTP and which protocols could just be it happens in 15 seconds. And, and then they need to fix NTP to work with all the things that require it. Um, let's see. Oh, and then the DNS infrastructure, there's a lot of work being done, like I said, about the speed of the DNS. And the, the thing about this I love is that there's nine top-level domains using the same AS. So they don't have any redundancy service provider-wise. They don't have any redundancy geographically. They're using the same... ISP basically, and that 
you know, it doesn't bode well for attacks or diversity or any of that sort of thing. Um, let's see. So um, I went to a technical plenary that had three awesome presentations about community networks. Like, they do exist, and we just have a proposal to help them. I think the most, in, my favorite of these three talks was um, the, the third guy who talked about um, all the different kinds of satellite networks that are being used to glue all these little teeny places together and the difference trade-offs between, you know, latency and cloud cover and because some of them are really affected by cloud cover and some of them are really affected by other things. And he, it, was, it was just really great. And I think that the one really great quote from this was that we care more about connecting refrigerators than we do people, poor people, which is really kind of sad, but kind of actually kind of a little bit true. So um, if you want to check it out, these guys are actually, maybe somehow we could get community networks to participate, I don't know. Anyway, it was a whole hour of community networks. So DNS operations, this is all about obviously the operation of the, the DNS and how we keep it all running. There's some really interesting talks Oh, let's see. So this is a, a draft by um, Ab Joe, Joe Abley, John? I can't think of his first name. I'm channeling John Curran right now. Joe Abley. And they're looking at um, how you could, get a, you could get a trust anchor if you, gracefully if there, is, if there isn't one available, how you can do a key roller, rollover in a, the absence of the Start the absence of the, the infrastructure. So, so it took me, I, sometimes I guess I'm a little dense, but it took me a while to get the DNS camel. But basically this is all about how many DNS RFCs we can have before we break the DNS, <laughs> break the camel's back. So there's a 185 DNS RFCs, that's like almost 3,000 pages, and it's getting harder and harder to write an implementation because there's more and more and more and more and more standards that affect how you write an implementation to do the DNS. So, and I do know for a fact that there's one DNS RFC that didn't happen and that was validating BGP routes with the DNS that was proposed in the 90s. And that didn't happen, but I think pretty much everything else has. So it's something to keep an eye on. And I, I like the three in NSEC three is the number of people who understand it. It's pretty good. Let's see. Here's a few more um, drafts. There's a terminology draft that's, that's being worked on. Let's see. And the, again, Jeff talks some more about the uh, key signing key rollover and, and what happened and what we need to do going forward. There's a lot of work being done on that. Here's some other drafts that we're not going to be talking about, but if you're interested, you could check them out. So the data center routing BOF, um, there's a lot of really interesting pathologies that happen, especially with link state protocols when you have all that density of, of networking all in one room, all connected together on the same virtual LAN and stuff that I never really thought about until I saw these hybrid um, well, anyway, I'll, I'm jumping ahead. But so most of this work is done in other groups, but I think they're really trying to get together like a co cohesive vision of what, a da what data center routing should look like and try to solve some of the really big problems of, of broadcast storms and those sort of things that are happening. So there, there's this whole new string of like distance vector and link state hybrid routing protocols to try to solve this problem. And yikes is my response to this. Like it's BGP, but it's OSPF, but it's BGP, but it's OSPF. Anyway, um, and the Rift is another proposed routing protocol to solve some of these problems. So if you're in the data center space, you might want to follow this because it's going to ho hopefully make life better. I'm not really sure yet. Let's see. These are some of the other stuff that's going on in that working group. Let's see. Um, so V6 ops. 
So the other thing I did with this presentation is I highlighted some of the things I didn't want to forget because every time I get up here, there's at least one slide that I look at and think, why in the world is that in here? I don't remember what I was going to say. So the bold stuff is mostly just for me. So let's see. These guys, these Mythic Beast guys, they started this IPv6 um, only data center, only hosting service basically. So it's all on v6 and they're coming across a number of different issues. They found that spam is filtered on a slash 64 boundary. So if, you, if your whole data center is in a slash 64, you're pretty much hosed if you have a spammer in there. So they're starting to do the prefix per customer just like some of the standards are now saying. Let's see. So Again, there's been a bunch of talks about fragmentation at both of the IETFs because, like I said before, the MTU is, we're still limited by Ethernet and there's some intention from perhaps somebody from the IETF to try to work on the, that with the IEEE, but I'm, I'm not really privy to that. So the fragmentation causes a lot of problems. So there was a V6 hack, hackathon. Um, there's a number of hackathons at the IETF now. And um, there, was, there were a number of problems that went away as soon as they upgraded the software. Um, and they're starting to, to define. There's a couple of things that happened at this IETF that kind of surprised me. And I'll talk about another one later. But this kind of surprised me. So what is IPv6 only? That's a really good question. Like I thought, oh, well, it's just IPv6. That's all you have is IPv6. That must be what IPv6 only is. But does it have a translation between v6 and v4? What kind of translation are you using? I mean, there's all these, you know, it, it's sort of like, you know, a bunch of people trying to figure out, with blindfolds on, trying to figure out what an elephant is. So we'll see how that comes along. So this is, there was a talk at um, the V6 only deployment at Cisco. They did it in a whole building. And um, these are some of the things that they found when they did that. Um, storage devices aren't using V6 yet. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. So there's more NAT64 deployment guidelines and um, V6 for point-to-point -point links. We're still debating about whether we should use a 128 or a slash 64 or whatever for our point-to-point -point links. So home net, my favorite, my very, very favorite uh, working group. So they're starting to talk about security in the home net. Again, something I thought maybe we should start with, but hasn't actually started that way. So they're starting to talk about security for the home net and how do you bootstrap the security for the home net. And there's different kinds of security, routing protocol security, perimeter security, like all that sort of stuff. And the working group charter, so when the working group was formed, so that was at least seven years ago, um, they were supposed to write a security document, but that hasn't happened yet. And I think Ted, yeah, Ted volunteered to write it. So we'll see how it turns out. Let's see. Oh, and they finally decided, because, you know, we had homenet.net or home.net was the domain for homenet, home.net. And then they didn't do all the proper work on the IETF side to actually make home.net be the network for home nets. So the IETF has complete control over .arpa, so they decided it would be home.arpa. So now the, the official default home network for your home will be home.arpa. And these are some more drafts that are going on in HomeNet. Some, some laughter from that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is another one of those things, like how do we define a home net again? Like, I thought maybe we had done that already, but I guess we didn't. But the, the good news is, is, I don't know if you guys know Jordy, um, Jordy Paulette, but he, he's actually really grappling with defining these things and writing documents to define them. And, you know, it's a thankless job, but he's, he's, giving, it a, he's giving it a shot. Let's see. Okay, so the IASA group, the, I'll just touch on this really quickly. So, 
just like what Nanog did when they decided to leave Merit and become their own organization, the IETF is, an act, is defined as an activity of the Internet Society. And it makes it difficult sometimes because the management, the leadership of the IETF can't sign a contract or they can't approve certain things and they need to have somebody at the Internet Society do that. And so they're looking at, do we form our own organization? Do we, you know, do we remain a, a subsidiary of ISOC? And so there's a bunch of work being done in that, you know, what, who do we want to be? How are we going to do this? I mean, they're still going to be really intertwined with the Internet Society because I'm not, I'm not sure that the, it'll ever be completely self-sufficient but it would be nice for the leadership to be able to do some of the things that leadership should be able to do. And I love this quote, you'll never find so much money with so few strings anywhere else. <laughs> but, um, but the, yeah. Okay, IBV6 maintenance. So V6 ops is all about V6 and V4 interoperating and being able to go between. And six man is all about maintaining the V6 protocol itself. So that's the distinction between the two groups. So this is more of a protocol upkeep. And then now we know that IPv6 is an official internet standard as of the end of last year, which is super cool. Um, this is the group that works on that. So they're working a lot on segment routing. And I know that you guys have heard me up here over and over again talking about how segment, uh, um, the headers, the extension headers are filtered a lot, but yet we're still making protocols that use them. So something has to give. We have to stop filtering them or we have to stop making protocols that use them. But there's a segment routing header where they're looking at using the header to route the packets through the network. Let's see. This is all about address usage and what, you might want to have multiple addresses for a device for multiple different functions, like a security address and a privacy address. And, a, and since V6 has so much address space, they're looking at all these different ways that you could use address space on devices. Um, let's see. So this is, um, I talked about this on my first slide. So they decided that they would turn off V4 in our meeting room. You could kind of get one of the access points if you tried really hard and you were sitting near the door. Not that I did that. <laughs> but they found this really interesting um, AP behavior where you lose your default route and then you couldn't get it back. And there was some, they changed some timeouts because basically it would work just fine for like 12 minutes, and then all of a sudden you couldn't ever, ever, ever get connected again. And everybody was really annoyed. But it was good to find the bug, and um, although I know the, the IETF last month, they didn't, do, they didn't turn off V4 and the V6 working groups, so somebody, I don't know. Anyway, this is a trade-off that we have at all these meetings. You know, people still have to get their work done at their day job. And if you muck around with the network, or like I always wanted at these meetings for us to turn the network off during the meeting because I thought it would be super cool if everybody was listening, but that didn't, that didn't go over very well. <laughs> so, and the dual stack hosts with happy eyeballs just switched to V4 and everybody was fine. But if you couldn't get to the access point, you were pretty much hosed. Let's see. Oh, and there's some, this, is a link at the bottom here to, um, there's a bunch of multi-vendor interoperability testing done and there's some work, some results from the segment header routing stuff. So if you wanna check that out. Um, that's, this is just some more stuff that's going on in Six Man. So operations area. So when I, when I don't have a working group that I feel that I have to go to, I go to these umbrella groups because these are where all the things that don't have a working group yet or don't fit into a working group or maybe someday they'll form a working group end up in operations area and routing area. And so I try to go to those because it gives me a little bit of an overview of other things that might be coming along, work that might be happening. And I talked last time about 
um, transport layer security and how the new version 1.3 is going to make it harder and harder, almost, actually it makes it impossible to actually look in the packets. And there's a lot of people that are really not comfortable with that because they have, there's banking regulations, there's all sorts of debugging, there's, there's any number of reasons why you might want to be able to decrypt a packet. And TLS 1.3 makes that, in essence, you can look at the header, but you can't really look at the payload anymore. So there's a lot of um, documentation, a lot of work being done to try to figure out where we go from here. I mean, there's the hardcore people that just want to do it. You don't ever get to look in there. <laughs> Tough luck. And then there's the people who are like, well, I'd really like to be able to have the key so I could look in there. So we'll see how that goes. OK, so network slicing. Um, there's a lot of work being done with network slicing. I'm not going to talk about it because <laughs> it's just, I'm not sure it's really super useful. So here's some more stuff that's going on. There's a lot of Yang models, which I think in our day they were called MIBs. But um, anyway, there's some more stuff being done there. OK, so the routing area working group is, again, another one of these umbrella groups that's all the routing stuff that isn't in a working group. And usually all the talks are by one guy. There's a lot of talks by the one guy. Um, OK, so this um, has been, I've talked about this at probably four or five of these talks now. This is the new multi-homing, V6 multi-homing um, draft. And it's going to last call. So you, if you're interested in how they think this is going to work and whether it cures the multi-homing issues, you should check it out because it's, it's almost a thing, although what was the other one? Shim 6 was a thing, but it didn't ever become a thing. So we'll see. Um, this is, again, more about um, data centers. And, their, and this is about data centers and hybrid networks. So maybe your data center, some of it's physically in the room, some of it's on the cloud, and, and different things like that. And then how do you make it a cohesive data center? It was kind of an interesting talk, although they give you, like, four minutes for an hour-long talk. I'm not familiar with that at all. <laughs> and so she got cut off. So um, this guy is, this is a, all about connecting air traffic with V6. And it was fairly interesting talk. Um, it's a separate BJ, BGP overlay that they're working on, and the planes will use it, and they're not sure if it'll connect to the global network or not. And the sub-network you're on depends where the plane is, so it's kind of interesting. Let's see. This is all about, so BCP38 is the, the best practices document that says you should filter your customers' routes because that helps with denial of service. And BCP84 is the best practices document that says this is what you do with that if you're multi-homed because just filtering at the edge if you're multi-homed is not good. So this is talking about this, how you do BCP84 with the intent of making your routes asymmetric because of various policy reasons. And I'm, yeah, that's basically, I didn't put the diagrams in because that would have been like 120 slides. And OK, so network telemetry, this is basically the IETF sort of putting together you know, all the documentation of what it's doing in this, in this space. Um, these are some more things. Link state over Ethernet. So this, <laughs> this is really funny. This woman, she, she, it was awesome. She got up and she. There's this whole presentation about link state over Ethernet, and she said, well, why don't you just use, what was it, OSPF discovery, router discovery or something, and they all were like, oh, maybe we, maybe we could do that. <laughs> so I'm not sure if this draft is going to go anywhere because, like, it's already solved. So, so CIDR operations. So in the beginning, there was the CIDR working group, which was basically working on the protocol, and now CIDR operations is, like, how do we deploy the protocol and how do we get it out there? Um, let's see. This was not popular. This is basically using a route server to do route val validation. 
there was a big, big, long line at the microphone of internet service providers saying, yeah, no. So, let's see. Um, some of the, um, I, the internet exchange providers are actually filtering invalid routes using the um, BG, secure BGP now. So, and this is some stats on that, which is cool, it's progress. Um, let's see. Oh, and we don't really want to have ROAs with multiple prefixes. We've, they've written that down over and over again. So this is another one of the things that I thought maybe we should have solved this already. But, okay, so you've got this BGP and you've got BGP SAC and you've got these signed routes and you have like a more specific and a, you have an aggregate and maybe the more specific one's valid and one's not valid. You know, how do you decide which route to choose? And I guess in my mind I thought this was already solved, but apparently it hasn't been. So there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what if one, what if the more specific makes the other one, the, I mean, what if one makes the other invalid, which, what do you do? Do you just punt? Like if the covering route is valid or the, um, the more specific is valid and the covering route isn't, then I, anyway, I, I needs, it needs to be documented what you do in all the cases where all the different failures with this, Sign routes. Let's see. Oh, so this. <laughs> I thought I might have been losing my mind, but um, Andy Newton affirmed my belief. So there was a big discussion in Singapore in this working group, and people were like yelling because the RIRs all have their own route to the RPKI, and it should be ICANN, and the RIRs apparently didn't tell anybody. It was like this really weird, but of course the RIRs have given presentations and documentation, and there's a reason why everybody has their own route to the tree. But it was, it was this huge argument about how bad we all are and how we didn't tell anyone. So that was fun. I thought it was jet lag, and then I went and talked to Andy, and he's like, no, no, you're right. <laughs> so, go figure. Let's see. Um, so this is about um, BGP origin validation in Colombia and what they're doing and how many signatures for routes that they have and that sort of thing. It's pretty cool. So the ILABOF, I was asked to go to this because it sounded like it pertained to addressing. And I, I guess it kind of does. So... Are you guys familiar with LISP? LISP was a protocol that you separate the location from the ID. It was a way to kind of fix destination-based routing, basically. So the ILA, the ILA protocol is basically LISP, but it doesn't use encapsulation. It just uses translation. But it has all the same problems. You have to have a database. You have to be able to map. So. I, I don't know, but it really didn't have much to do with addressing. So I, um, I watched, and it's the same guy who presented, he presents this, he made a new version of GRE, which is a tunneling protocol called GUE, G-U-E. And it's like, why do we need another one? I don't know. But I was sitting right in front of the guy who started and wrote the code for the first Lisp stuff, and we had a good time. <laughs> Let's see. So in area is another one of these overarching groups for the internet area and maybe drafts that are not ready for a working group yet. Um, this is um, NAT, carrier grade NAT and law enforcement. And this is all about um, what they need from, you know, a lot of, a lot of information gets hidden with the NAT. And so this is a document, this is a presentation all about how do, you, how do you get law enforcement what they need when it's behind a NAT. Um, let's see. And I was just complaining about the guy who wrote Goo and all these varying tunneling protocols. There are tunnel, there are like 1,500 RFCs that have tunnels in them. And you get to the point where if you have that many standards if you have that many standards that do the same thing, then you don't really have a standard because I could implement A and you could implement B and he could implement C and you're all implementing a standard but they don't interoperate. So we're all, the IETF is constantly trying to 
figure out, it's just like with all the DNS, all the things we're putting in the DNS, how much more can you put in there? How many more tunneling protocols can you have? It's, I don't know if it's a solvable problem because people need to do what they need to do, but it makes it harder and harder to run a network. Let's see, and there's some more drafts. Um, okay, operational security is another working group that I went to, I think in London. Yeah, so this document is security considerations for V6 networks, and it's gonna go to last call, so you might wanna check that out. Oh, and I just knew it, blockchain can really fix everything. So this, this was a talk about doing the whole RPKI and all that DNSSEC stuff with blockchain, which I thought made me really happy somehow. So pretty interesting exercise, but probably not gonna happen at this point. Let's see. And Again, the TLS 1.3 and the inability to be able to look into the packets spans multiple groups, so you hear about it multiple times. Let's see. Oh, okay, so and then I went to the IRTF. So there's the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and there's the IRTF, the Internet Research Task Force, and they're parallel organizations, but the IRTF works on things that maybe aren't ready to be an Internet standard yet, but forward thinking, they write RFCs, but they're informational that, that will hopefully become an internet standard at some point or a protocol that we use on the network. And so they're talking about quantum internet, the quantum internet research group. And I, I'm having a hard time with the whole quantum internet thing. Maybe it's because I'm not a physicist or whatever, but I did find this quote, you know, there's no real definition of what it means. So we'll see what comes out of the, quantum internet research group, or maybe somebody here can enlighten me. I don't know. So again, I was on the committee that helped pick the winners for the Applied Network Research Prize. So those very two first papers that mentioned us um, were in the pool of you know, probably 100 papers that were submitted, published papers that were submitted. And these are two, every IETF, there are a couple presentations of the winners. Um, and these were two of the winners. So the first one was all, she talked all about, she did a whole bunch of research on video streaming and whether throughput is a bigger issue than latency. It's really a lot of really in-depth information using a number of different video services. Um, and then the Vroom one is all about speeding up the web on your phone. And, about every other thing he said, said, well, and then that didn't work, but he did have some things that worked, so that was pretty cool. So I was gonna put this toward the, I wasn't even gonna talk about this, but then I remembered, okay, so I've talked about the human rights group a bunch. It's all about human rights and internet protocols, which was hard for me to get my brain around in the beginning, but there's a, a woman um, at the, this was Singapore, so in November, she took all of the RFCs from the beginning of time till now, and she looked at them against the International Declaration of Human Rights, and it was really interesting. Like, where does it mention human rights? What, how do you, does she think they affect human rights? And she's not an IETF person or anybody who would be in this room, so it was, it was a really interesting take on where we are and where we need to go. So if you, her link is right there. Um, and then these are some of the other discussions that are going on in that, in that group. So I knew it wouldn't be complete without footwear of the IETF. And I surreptitiously took these photos and you know, as he stands on the shoes, they change color. So I had to time it just right to get all three colors <laughs> while he was standing three feet away from me at the microphone. I just want you to know I did that just for you. I did. Um, he is, um, I would say, probably in his 40s. And he has light up shoes, but we won't mention any names. And he's a professor. So there you have it. So these last groups I put as a ex complete exercise for the reader. Um, 
And there's some slides at the end because I went to these. The first one is basically internet of, in, industrial internet of things over V6. Um, SEC Dispatch is the group that takes all the security stuff and figures out what to do with it that doesn't have a working group, so it's another one of those umbrellas. And the other ones are too, um, yeah. So these are where you can get all of the different slides and tools and research and all that stuff. And if you're, if you're looking something up and you can't find it and you don't know which IETF it was, just let me know. I've had that happen and I've pointed, oh, that was in Singapore or that was in London. If you're going to your first IETF, talk to me, but also there's a video that has someone that looks eerily like me in it. <laughs> But it's like a cartoon about how you should read stuff and not be offended when people are mean to you. And there's IETF Sisters, which is a group of women who meet at the IETF. And um, if you go to Nanog or RIPE or any of the NOGs, there's the Net Girls if you're a woman and you want to hook up with some women to get in, in, involved in the group, or the society. So that's, that's what I've got. Any questions? Any questions for Kathy? Or on the thoughts or something? I you were there and you want to add more? Or? No questions for Kathy. Excellent wow. report. Thank you very much. <laughs>